Good to see you here tonight. Continuing to look at this uh, amazing uh, panorama of the life of Jesus. We're looking tonight at Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 25. We'll look at some other verses, but we're beginning, beginning with that. So turning your Bibles to Matthew 10, 5 to 25. Remember now, disciple making, looking at it in phases. Uh, first of all, come and see. We talked about that. We're, the first thing Jesus said when someone asked him, where do you stay? Where, where you? He said, just come and see. So he invited people to come and, and take a look at his life, a life with him. And remember, if we read the Gospels and you read them correctly, then he uh, allowed them to go back home. They went back home. And then uh, said, come and follow me. And so they, again, they, they came and they followed after him for a while. And he sent him back home. And then the commitment came. Come and be with me. He chose to have. And that's where we've been looking at this now for the third, the third installment of this, Matthew 10, 5 to 25. Stand with me if you will as I read uh, this passage from God's Word. Follow along in your Bibles or on the screen. These twelve, now we've just, the previous verses have named them, and we looked at the disciples, who they were, kind of did a little background of them. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go right into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two, two tunics or sandals or staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. And as you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your word, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it would be more, more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Now that's what we're going to look at tonight. Well, I want to read the, these rest of these verses in this section because it ties to what we're looking at on Sunday morning. I want you to see just how this was conversationally so with Jesus. He says, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. Sound familiar? We read this this morning uh, from another gospel account. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it's not you who speak, but the, Holy, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And Lord, help us tonight to see further, clearer, with more conviction, disciple-making. Thank you. you. may be seated. Jesus is introducing them to a level of training that's, I would say, more uh, in-depth, more, more implications, than what he's shown them thus far. He's apprenticing these 12. There comes a time, though, when the student has got to take off the training wheels, though, and ride the bike on his own. In fact, that, that analogy uh, is appropriate, I think. I don't know how many of you taught your children, your child, to ride a bike maybe a young relative, but you know the drill. 
they initially ride with, with three wheels on the back, one big one, two little ones, and that way when they're wobbling, it catches them and they stay up. And, they, and the day comes when you take the training wheels off, but you don't just turn them loose. You, you Remember you held onto the back of the seat, kind of guided them along, and they would ride real wobbly, real wobbly, and they would kind of go down. But you're there with, holding the seat, so it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. And you began to kind of run with them a little bit, uh, holding the seat a little more loosely. And then the day came when you were running with them and you let go of the seat. And they were pedaling and they were, they were doing great until what? Until they realized you were not holding on to the seat. And they crashed. They dusted them off. But you know what? From that they learned that they were able to go on their own. Well, that's, that's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He's been, he's been leading them and uh, he's uh, send them out and come back and report. But you see, if spiritual multiplication is to take place, then converts have got to mature into established disciples who then must ripen. We talked about this last week, the difference between an established disciple and, and a, an equipped laborer. They've got to get there. In fact, it's arguable that you're not really equipped until you're a laborer. They need to be able to, to nurture and train other disciples through the same growth process. It is the Great Commission. I just put it up there again for you so you can see the, the text. You know it, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Going therefore, make, all, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, here it is, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There is the model. I've commanded you not just to listen and say agree, but to do. I'm sending you out now the same agenda, commanding them, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So all that I've taught you, you impart to them. All that I've showed you to do, you impart to them. They're, you, you weren't my disciples really until you were doers. You weren't my mature disciples until you were doers. Now these folks need to be doers. And we looked at one this morning. We looked at the, the, the end of the life of Bishop Polycarp. Certainly, certainly he got that and passed it on. The goal of a congregation ought to be to transform spectators, people from being spectators, led by a minister into an army of ministers being led by a pastor. That should be the goal. Did you get that? Transform a congregation of spectators being led by a minister into an army of ministers being led by a pastor. Karen and I were eating lunch at the uh, open table. It was a last Sunday, maybe. Was it last Sunday? Sitting across from a uh, someone from another church and they had their bulletin there and Karen picked up the bulletin and looked at it and it was listing staff and different things and it said ministers colon everyone that's what he's talking about it's about to send them off into the harvest field there's parameters he's going to give them an assignment really it's got to be challenging enough uh, to allow the person to be tested or stretched. You know, the old the, a person who stretches like a rubber band, or a stretch rubber band never comes back to its to the smallness of its shape before. We all, when we're stretched, is when we grow. But it's got to be within the bounds, within the limits, so that it doesn't overtax. It's it's a release. It's a, it's a gradual process, just like I described riding a bike. When we look at the text I read to you, these first 13, 14 verses, you see that there's, a, there's some principles here that I want to share with you. First of all, he sends them out two by two. Two are better than one. It's interesting, you will not see Jesus send them out one by one. He sends them out two by two, whether it's the 12 or whether it's the 72 later on. Two by two. Knowing full well that if you do the math, if you send them out one by one, you can potentially cover twice the area. But that's, it's, uh, saturation was not the issue. Uh, success in advancing the gospel was the issue. In fact, one writer suggested that 
that two is the ideal number. A three, you can you can get at odds. Three, you can begin to one can feel like somebody's playing favorites with the other if they're engaged in ministry. And two, they're dependent on one another. Uh, I think there's some wisdom in that as you're going out laboring. Both people have the opportunity to fully utilize their gifts if they're going two by two. Each one leans on the other. Each one encourages the other. At this point in the ministry, it's important to note, they've been watching Jesus. If you study the chronology of the gospel, they've been watching Jesus for 16 months, almost a year and a half, learning from him, traveling with him, not just sitting back arms folded. He's engaged them at some level, but, but they have been taking it in, taking it in, taking it in. Two can develop a closeness, particularly when you, when you find yourself engaged in ministry. That's a context in which closeness develops. Brother Norman mentioned this morning about our life transformation groups. The group that he's involved in has four people in it, and you grow close at that level. When you're, when you're sharing one another, being accountable with one another, bearing one another's burdens, talking about the Word of God together, you, there's a closeness that develops. But there are two going on without Jesus walking physically with them, and so they pray together. They, they think together. They plan they can't turn around when he sends them out two by two and ask Jesus for advice. They can be accountable to one another two by two. Second thing he did is he gave them authority. And this is a principle that's very important. You never ask someone to start a task unless you give him or her the authority to complete the job. It's the most frustrating thing in the world to ask someone to do something but they don't have the authority to carry it out. Jesus, if you read the text, made it very plain. Here's what you are to do. Here's, what you're not. here's where you are to go. Here's where you're not to go. He uh, sets the boundaries. Mark 6, 7 says he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. It's not just going to be an encounter for them. Jesus has, uh, has enabled them and equipped them to take authority. Authority breeds confidence, and confidence enhances performance. The third thing I think he did is he specified the audience. Do not go among the Gentiles. Do not go to the Samaritans, not at this point. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. It's, uh, he puts them into a situation in a population where they would be familiar. You know, Jesus did not say, okay, now I'm going to send you out. You, you two, you go to the Parthians where they would have just encountered no telling what. You go to the, to the Bithynians. No, he puts them into, into a, a culture they were familiar with where they could maximize the skill sets they have and they would have a minimum of barriers. They wouldn't have language barriers. Jesus' plan, according to God's plan, was that the Jews be the first ones to hear the good news of the gospel. They weren't the last ones. The Jews presented very few theological and cultural barriers for the twelve. One writer I was reading said that you need to, you need to limit the options of people. If Jesus had just said, go and encounter anyone you, you meet, that could have been overwhelming to them. They could have bumped into people that, that didn't have the same Jewish predispositions, um, monotheism, the, the worship of the true and living God, a lot of things, and they could have been bewildered by people from other, other perspectives, questioning. So it was very specific. Fourth, he clarified the objective. What did he tell them to do? Verse 7. Proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Actually, he did not tell them, 
go and debate the fine points of these things. I was reminded when I was studying through this this week, years ago I was in Oklahoma City at a meeting, and there was a pastor who was an, an older pastor, seasoned guy, wise guy, just very, very keen. He uh, was talking about sharing the gospel with folks. A very humble man. He said, people will ask me, well, what, are you, well, what about such and such? Some, you know, how people do when you get to talking to them on the topic of religion or Christianity. He said, well, I don't know a whole lot about that. But I do know that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Well, but, but what, do you, what do you think about this and then the other? He said, well, I don't know a whole lot about that, but I, I do know that God so loved the world that he, and he says, I thought, how keen. It was, he just stayed on point. Jesus clarified, go and preach that the kingdom of heaven is near. Very focused message. And folks, I, our message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This doesn't mean we ignore the other things, but, but one of Satan's tools is to get us off point, to distract us. I will never forget, I was in seminary, I think I've told you about this before, I was in seminary, that was a long time ago, they took us out on, one of my evangelism classes, we, would, we had to, be, to go out on Friday nights, they would just put us in this van. It was a cargo van. Didn't even have seats in it. We just sat on the floor of the cargo van. They stuffed as many seminary students as they could into it and head to downtown Fort Worth. And they drop us off on street corners and tell us, we're going to pick you back up. It's such, we have to be out there two or three hours on Friday night. And you just engage people. Those are some interesting times. Um, but I'll never forget there was a group a group of our guys, three or four, had encountered a group of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I was down a good half a block or more trying to stop people and talk to them about Jesus. And I could hear them shouting. They got into a shouting match over the version of the Bible. I mean, it was just, it was just, just, all, just debate. It was awful. I thought, we have, no matter what we're trying, now look, they do this every semester. So you know some folks downtown Fort Worth are going, oh my goodness, here they come again. But, but uh, I thought, how, what a terrible witness. These fellows let themselves completely get off point. Jesus didn't. He focused. He said, go, this is your message. And you almost hear him saying, but people say, well, what about sin? I don't know a whole lot about that, but the kingdom of heaven is near. You need to get ready for it. It's coming. The Jew, by the way, would have, would have made a connection. Kingdom of heaven to a Gentile would not have meant a whole lot. Kingdom of heaven to the, to the Jew meant a lot. That, that, was, that was language for Messiah. The coming of Messiah is close at hand. The manifestation of the anointed one is close at hand. That's what they would understood in that. And so he was sending them out to prepare that. When you think about how Jesus handled them, the disciples' responsibility is to ensure that everyone can effectively share his own faith, which is, by the way, the first thing we did. If you remember the, the sequence, September 11, 2005, Karen and I show up on her birthday, and September 12th, myself and uh, some of the associate pastors headed over to a church in the area to take faith evangelism training. I've told you before, not, not because I needed evangelism training, but because we needed to get certified in that to teach it legitimately. Everybody needs to know how to share their faith. Those opportunities ought to be offered. As you grow, though, you won't give a canned approach to the follow the faith acrostic, F-A-I-T-H, you will share the gospel from the scriptures and from your growing faith experience. We need to train people to share their faith. We need to convince people that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a witness. One of the devil's lies is that you don't, you don't know enough to talk to others about Christ, or, or you're not living perfectly enough to talk to others about Christ. It's, all, it's just lies, because his agenda is to shut you and me up. 
And so we need to recognize that. And, and as we teach people that, we teach them a high regard for the scriptures. I can't stress enough. I, it may get old to you, but it'll never get old to me. That's why we say every Sunday here, this is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Isaiah 55, 11, the Lord says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish the purpose for, with, for which it was sent forth. A confidence in the word. I don't know a whole lot about that, but I'll tell you, I do know that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't know a whole lot about this other thing. And the older I get, the more, the more I need to remind myself, don't let the devil ever trip you up with what you know. Well, I've studied now for X decades. I can discuss that too. But does it take you off a gospel focus? Paul said, I, I gave you, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 4, I gave you that which is which of first importance, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. That he was buried, he was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul said, well, is that priority number one? And number two is there's a, there's a gap, there's a distance from it. Confidence in the Word, sharing people with that which is most needful to them. And he told them, of course, he gave them specifics, healing the sick, raising the dead, delivering the demon-possessed, uh, how to finance the ministry, even talked about clothing, what to take with them, what not, uh, how to find lodging. That's all in the, in the passages that we looked at there, both in Matthew uh, and in Mark, so that they would, they would have an agenda to follow. He gave them that agenda. He didn't say, just go and let the Lord lead you. No, he gave them an agenda to follow. He talked about looking for someone worthy in the house. What does that mean? I mean, nobody's worthy of the gospel. Someone who, who manifests an openness to them, to their rabbi, and to their message. There's a lesson there, folks. And I look back, there's, there's times in my ministry I have wasted my time on people who were not willing to hear. Life's too short to waste precious moments on people not willing to hear when there are people whom God has prepared who are willing to hear. And that's what he's talking about the same thing. Let your peace return to you. In other words, take the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ that you, that you brought there in terms of a message and take it and leave. Another place he says, shake the dust off your, your feet, off your sandals. Okay? So, so he gave them something, a track to run on. Well, our, our missionaries today call it looking for a person of peace. And we talked about this when we first started this study on Sunday nights. That used to be more of a cross-cultural thing internationally. But folks, I'm telling you, the, the culture here is so darkened and so, so uh, rapidly becoming antagonistic to Christianity that we need to find people of peace. We need to find someone who will, who will receive, if not accept, at least listen to us tell them the good news of Jesus and his love. So Mark chapter 6, verse 12 to 13 says, They went out and proclaimed that people should repent. They cast out demons, anointed with all many who were sick, and healed them. Again, why did they do that? They, did not, they, didn't, they didn't cast demons out of everybody. They didn't heal everybody that was sick. The, the, that kind of manifestation, miraculous manifestation, was designed by Jesus. He taught it himself in the Gospel of Mark so that people, if people can see you do that, then they will be likely to hear the spiritual things that can't be measured. How can you measure that a heart's been changed? Jesus said it. Which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say to the cripple on the mat, rise, take up your mat, your bed and walk. The purpose of the miracles 
the purpose with which he sends the disciples out to perform miracles is to give a window into the master's power and authority to forgive sins. So we as disciple makers have got to be focused on things and we have got to impart to others a focused agenda. And, and you see what happens. Look at Luke 10, 17. When the 72 were sent out, they come back. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They, they, they had an amazing experience. And that's what you want. That's what you want. There's accountability. They came back and gave, a, gave an account. They gave a uh, report. And if you study through this, this phase of, God, of Jesus' disciple making, uh, there's continuous review. There's application. How he responds to them when they tell him about the demons being subject is pretty fascinating. You ought to read it sometime. So a disciple maker, following Jesus' example, has got to be committed along these lines. Willing to impart that. Willing to get feedback. And willing to continue to be a part of the, of the growing process until that person they are discipling becomes himself or herself a disciple maker. We don't do discipleship like the world does some of its business. Look at Mark 10, 42 and 43. Jesus called to them. We looked at this recently on Sunday mornings. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. And I told you then, when you look at this in the original language, it's, it's, it's not that wordy, but it shall not be so among you. It is not so you. Whoever be great among you must be your servant. So, quick summary here. During this first phase, come and see, they were curious converts, one fellow called them. Gradually exposed by Jesus to, to the nature, the flow of ministry. In the second phase, come and follow me. He was establishing these young disciples. Remember what he was immersing them in? Scripture, a scripture study, prayer, witnessing, fellowship, and worship. The five hubs, the five spokes of the Christian life and of Christian ministry. I was telling Norman, we were talking about this this morning, and when I was working on my, my Doctor of Ministry at Southwestern Seminary, I was required in one of my classes to write a philosophy of ministry. So I went to the New Testament and reading through it and, and, and recognized these five terms. The, the reading the scriptures, prayer, evangelism, koinonia or fellowship, and then worship. And so I, I built a paper a presentation around that and presented it in class and this was back in the day when the when seminaries we were our, our seminaries were going through a early days what we called the conservative resurgence so you had some guys in seminary that were not biblical conservatives theological conservatives uh, and so my professor said to me to the class he said I asked for a philosophy of ministry and Mr. Askell gave us a simple word study well I took exception to that and after class went to see him in his office, I said, I want to talk with you about your comments on my presentation. I said, you asked for a philosophy of ministry. The New Testament informs ministry for me. What were you looking for? He said, so I was looking for you to, you know, to other sources and all. I said, well, if you, if you have a source that you think has more authority than the scriptures, I'm glad to hear it. And he got real nervous at that point because the whole thing was about the authority of Scripture, the whole debate going on. And uh, he said, no, it's, it's genuine. Let it stand. I said, no, no, I'm not going to let it stand. You said in class that I did not give you a philosophy of ministry. I gave you a simple word study. I want to know. 
What does one, what does one look like? You've got to remember now, I've already finished my master's. I'm already serving in a church. The, the doctorate wasn't going to add any curl to my pigtail. It was just something I was trying to, to do to, to improve my, my ministry skills. So we're not, we're not young students in these classes. And uh, he said, well, maybe people who have influenced you, you know. That, that's what I was thinking. The folks have influenced you through the years. And I said, well, Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul have been a great influence on my thinking about ministry. I, again, if you know somebody that's a greater influence than them, I'm open to hear it. Jesus burned these five things into the minds and the hearts of his disciples. There was stoicism when they were around. There were other worldviews. There was, there was writings in Judaism, for crying out loud. But it was these things that he taught them that were essential and from which would develop a life, Christian life, and in Christian ministries. And so the third phase, though, come and be with me, he's now prepared them to strike out on their own. They go from a, what one fellow called an unexplored commitment to an active responsibility. They're no longer just spectator disciples. They're becoming productive disciple makers. We all need to get there. Probably are there. Need to advance in that. And so, as he moves toward the end of ministry, he's going to, what we're going to see when we get into phase four, he's going to deepen the convictions and sharpen the ministry skills of these fellows. So we look at what they had to say when, when they came back. Look at Mark 6, 30 to 31. I want to shift gears a little bit here. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they'd done and taught. Think about this. You, just, you heard Luke a while ago. The demons were subject to us. Now, folks, if some, if some men had gone off on a, on a mission trip and came back with that, uh, they would be being interviewed by Baptist state papers and probably in local newspapers. Look what Jesus said, though. Verse 31, he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. We've told you before, Jesus understood the ebb and flow of ministry. And, he, and his thought process was very different than it is today. I could point situation after situation where, where the Lord has blessed some man in ministry and, and he's seen a, a huge increase and, and, and then he becomes a spokesman traveling around to teach about this. He's, he's taken out of, the, out of the flow of what God called him to do. We're, Jesus didn't do that. He has them withdraw. They just had one of the highest spiritual times of their lives, he has them withdraw so that they can take it in. They can, they can reflect and understand what we just saw was not about us. It's about the master and the kingdom. Because see, when you, when you lose that connection, all manner of problems can erupt. So he takes them aside. Verse 32 to 34 says, They went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. It gives you a sense of the, at this point in Jesus' ministry, as we talked about it when we went through Mark 6 on Sunday morning, there's a real popularity, there's a real pressing, there's a real desire by the people to be touched and blessed by him. But remember, that was not his primary agenda. You've got to keep that in focus. Jesus' purpose here was not to bless as many people as possible while he was here. His purpose was twofold. It was to go to the cross and die for our sins and rise from the grave and to train 12 men, a small group of men, to carry on for him. Can you imagine if Christianity had been just scattershot to thousands, the, thousands, the crowds of thousands that hurt him? and left them to take it. He didn't do that. Poured himself into 12 men. 
particularly into three. So verse 34, he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So he's teaching the crowd. Jesus does have compassion. One of the, we talked about this recently. One of the great hallmarks of Christians is to have compassion on, on the poor, on the, on the needy, on the downtrodden. These sheep without a shepherd. When Jesus could have argued, can I have a, just a moment to myself, he had compassion. I read this. Compassion is the quality that makes such things as courage, hard work, discipling, planning, and skill meaningful. Without compassion, it's the same thing the Gentiles could do, same thing the Pharisees could do. And all of the energies, all the movements in Christendom, if not flamed by compassion, will simply make Pharisees. Jesus taught the truth as he taught his disciples to teach the truth. John 8, 32, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. He identified himself in John 14, 6 as the way, the truth, and the life. So he's teaching these things, these folks, many things out of a heart of compassion. And it gets late in the day, remember? The disciples said, you need to cut this off. It's, it's getting late. These folks are going to get hungry. They've got to go find their own food. They've got to find a meal. And Jesus said to them, notice how he's challenging them now. Mark 6, 37. You give them something to eat. And he's shown compassion. Well, I think he's challenging the disciples. Have some compassion here. And he said, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them? Because they didn't have 200 denarii. How do you want us to do that exactly? That's what they're asking. And so we don't know exactly what transpired, but, but apparently they began sort of going through the crowd to see if there was a solution. And it's interesting, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother in John chapter 6, verse 9, comes to Jesus and says, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. So, so okay, on the one hand you think, well, great. But he goes ahead and says what everybody's thinking. But what are they for so many? What, how's that going to help anybody? We found somebody with, with, with a lunch Commend Andrew, he was doing his best, but he knew his best was, very, was, was coming up way short in the face of the need. You wonder, was Andrew saying, this is all we have, Lord, but you're going to have to do something with it because this is not going to meet the need that we have. Is that what Andrew was doing? Because Andrew seems to be that kind of a hopeful person. He brought his brother Simon to Jesus. And when you see this attitude that he's, he's cultivating, he's nurture, nurturing in his disciples, we have to turn it back on ourselves and ask, how, do we, how does he see us operating as a, in our individual Christian lives and as Christian homes and as Christian churches? If only we had, if only, if only we had this, if only we had that, if, then we could really do. And what we learn as we watch this episode unfold is that Christ, first of all, hasn't shortchanged his people. We have to believe if this is a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, then he has given this church everything it needs right now. And if we don't see it, it says more about our sight than it does about his provision. Well, what, what brings that to the, to the bubbling up to the surface? Disciple making. 
disciple making is the only thing that will. Disciple making is the only is the only arena in which untapped resources begin to rise as, as undiscipled members become disciplers themselves. And what we should be cultivating more of, my own heart and yours, is this attitude of, here, Lord, don't know how to do this, but you do. This is all I have. You take it. You multiply it. You're going to have to multiply it. I can't do that, Lord. Thirty-fold, hundred-fold, thousand-fold. You're going to have to do it, Lord. So he taught them a lesson of his, of his powerful provision. You know the story. Just look at Mark 6, 43, where the conclusion of it, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Start out as one small lunch. They, they gather up the uh, leftovers. And that may be, we read that and think, that's weird. Not if you're in Haiti, it's not weird. In Haiti, the guests eat, and then the young people, and when I was there teaching the pastor's conference, the, the pastor's, and young people waited until the teachers ate. Now, I didn't know what was going on initially, and when you discover that, I promise you, you cut back your portions when you know that that's what's happening. But they, they didn't bat their eyes at eating leftovers. It was the only thing they had to eat. So they gather up these leftovers, and they literally get to chew on this, this situation for a while. And think about his provision, how he was able to take very little and make very much out of it. And that's the same Jesus we serve today. It's the same Jesus that, that we're living for today, learning from. Now after this, this is fascinating what happens here. Chapter 6, verses 45 to 46 of Mark. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. So he sends them off in a boat. You know what's going to happen, we studied through this, is a storm's going to arise. After he'd taken leave of them, went up on the mountain to pray. Verse 48, he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. He was, he was willing to walk right by them if they did not notice him. Sometimes we say, well, Jesus didn't show up. Well, we've got to look for him. We've got to be the ones looking for him. If we're his followers, then our, our goal is not to ever stray far from him. That wherever we're going in life, whatever we're engaged in, we want to be near. We, we sing a hymn, Nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee. So here they are between 3 and 6 in the morning. The storm is, is blasting them. Jesus comes to them. Now we would like to think that they would, that they would have said to one another, look, he just fed us miraculously. He can take care of this situation, but that's not what you got, was it? In fact, the amazing thing about when you, is you simply read through the Gospels and let the Gospels speak to you about Jesus' method of disciple making is that even when they faced a situation with another crowd that needed to be fed, the disciples still didn't know how to feed them. Now before we condemn them or judge them, we have to ask ourselves, how many lessons has Jesus taught us through the years and that we act like we've forgotten when we, when we face circumstances where those, those what we call past mercies should come to bear? Of course, you know what Peter did. Verse 28, Lord, if it's you, command, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus bid him come and he steps out on the water, but when he sees the wind, he's afraid, begins to sink. Lord, save me. And I like what one writer said when I was looking at this passage. Peter began to sink because he was suffering from the paralysis of human analysis. 
He goes from, from a faithful gaze upon Jesus to a study of the situation and he basically says, what I'm, what I'm doing can't be done. This can't be done. I'm not supposed to be doing this. And I promise you, we have an enemy of our souls who would throw those kinds of things in our faces every time we venture out to do something bold for Christ. He's the liar who says it can't be done. Shouldn't do it. It's not wise. It's not safe. What is the line in the, the line the witch in the wardrobe when the children ask about Aslan? Is he safe? What's the answer? No, but what? He's good. So Jesus, verse 31, reaches out his hand, takes hold of him, and he says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? So he gets into the boat. As soon as he steps in the boat with him, verse 51, the winds and the waves stop. They're astounded, and Mark says, and the reason that they're astounded with this is they still didn't understand about the loaves. He talks about their hearts being hardened, and it doesn't mean that they're, that they're turned against the Lord. It just means they are dull. They're not, they're not gripped and quickened like the heart of a disciple's got to become. So, what we discover of them and we discovered of ourselves, that's what I want to get to, is these great moments, these high watermarks in our lives, and we all had them, you've had them. We like to think, well, man, we can retain that and, and, and run the rest of our lives off of that. But here's the principle. Yesterday's manna will not feed us today. You've got to commune with Jesus day by day. And, and eventually, as maturation takes place, the pieces of the puzzle of who Jesus is who he is in relation to us, these pieces come together. They don't come together immediately, and that's critical. See, I think sometimes we want to, we want to sugarcoat and, and paint in pristine pastels the, the disciples. Folks, they were frail creatures of dust just like you and I are. And I suggested to you when we looked at them that the reason Jesus chose such people was to encourage us all in the future. Never assume that awe-inspiring moments automatically lead to lessons permanently learned. They're learned in the day-by-day -day hammering out of a life lived for Christ. It's frustrating when a disciple maker sees a disciple getting his theology right in his head but doesn't see the application of it in life. It's easy to speak of the sovereignty of God over life. But do I believe his sovereignty over me? To say God can do anything, but do I believe he can do anything for me here and now? And so it takes the repeated experience of, of living out the gospel, following this agenda that Jesus has given. A laborer, which we've just, if you remember our categories, a laborer is a mature disciple, one who is engaged, acting, growing. They need to understand some things, have a fair theological understanding and a philosophical understanding of, of what the world needs, that is the gospel, know what scripture teaches concerning who God is, what salvation is, how we carry the gospel, the need for making disciples, the importance of calling out laborers into the harvest fields, training people to, as Paul said, equip 
others who will take faithful men and equip others also and keep that going. The challenge is to start and maintain a ministry with Jesus Christ in charge. We said this before when we were first studying uh, purpose statement and discipleship, the discipleship wheel several years ago. But a church needs to understand that we do not consider making disciples just one of the ministries. A church of the Lord Jesus Christ has got to become a discipling center. And everything we do comes under those lenses for scrutiny. We've got to understand why. Why do we want to move people through the stages of convert, disciple, laborer, leader, or disciple maker? And how do we do that? And we've been, we've been laying this out for you here. We've offered you I think the simplest, most clearly stated tool to accomplish this, and that's a life transformation group. Otherwise, if you, if you don't have it that sharpened, then you're just going to drift out to sea like other well-intended followers of Christ. I came across this, and I think it's important for our study. One writer about disciple making said, conviction, ministry skills, and supervisory attention form the three essentials that set apart the equipped laborer from the established disciple. A conviction that this is, this is what we ought to be doing. If you don't have that, you'll never get to the other two. If you don't have a conviction about disciple making, then, then I can promise you it won't happen. If you have a conviction about it, though, that this is, this is Jesus method, his plan, his example for advancing his kingdom and growing his church. The ministry skills, you'll be interested in, in developing those. Supervisory attention, you'll be, you'll be willing to be, to be taught, to be supervised, to be engaged and be engaging. So you look at this feeding of the 4,000 real quickly in Mark 8, 16. They, they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. They're standing there with the bread of life. And they're looking at the pantry. And Jesus is going to begin to ramp it up. And again, you need a timeline. When we come to passages like I'm going to read in a few minutes from Mark 8 and Luke 9 and 14, where he's, it's his call to discipleship, where he begins to clarify discipleship. This is only 10 months before he goes to the cross. Listen to this. Mark 8, 31 to 38. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this plainly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter, the leader of this group, the spokesperson, one thing about the things of God, he's thinking about the things of man. He's thinking like a man and not thinking like, like the Lord. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. It's a similar theme in Luke chapter 9, verse 22 to 25. The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and the third day be raised. If anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, follow me. Whoever would lose, it's the same thing, you see this. Save his life will lose it, lose his life for my sake will save it. Then again in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. 
Someone came to him and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, the fox, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another, he said, follow me. And he said, well, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Well, in other words, what we're about is a life mission. We're about a life-saving mission, not, not sitting by watching people die. The dying can bury the dead. We have words of life. That's what he's telling him here. But it's for you to go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And then the, then the last one I want to read to you is Luke 14. You're familiar with these. I just want you to hear how he's intensifying the teaching ministry. Great crowds accompanied him. He turned them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and, yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He gives the examples he gives. Which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid foundation, he's not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him. And they say, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I want you to put yourself there. First of all, put yourself as the crowd. You've shown an interest in Jesus. A great crowd has gathered to hear the rabbi, hopefully to see him perform miracles. You've heard he does some amazing miracles. Hopefully to perform a miracle in your life. And this is what he tells you. I must be exclusively supreme. Put yourself in the position of the twelve. They have thoughts of grandeur. They're looking for some, some amazing church growth. They see crowds following it everywhere. And he teaches this. And Jesus doesn't take disciples on the disciples' terms. You see that. Lord, I'll follow you, but Jesus says, no buts. No buts. I'll follow you if, no ifs. His willingness to call 12 and spend three plus years with them. His willingness to take three of those 12 and take them places he never took the others. His willingness to stand and speak to huge crowds and speak difficult words tells us that he's about an agenda that I don't think folks think very clearly about. He is making sure that by the time he gets to the cross, he will have equipped those whom he has called to carry on for him. Now, where are you in your stage in life? Are you making sure of that? Are you making sure that when you go, not necessarily to your cross, but to your grave, that you will have spent the time investing others who will carry on the gospel that you have been called to carry on. That's sobering, brothers and sisters. That is sobering. Jesus could say in the Garden of Gethsemane before he hung on the cross, remember, I have finished the work you gave me to do. He's not dead yet. That's, a, that's part of the work God's given him to do, but he's not talking about hanging on the cross. He's talking about preparing these 
disciples. As he himself is the chief disciple maker, preparing them that when he's gone and the Spirit comes, that the work that the Father gave him to do will be carried on by them. If you're gone, who carries on your gospel work? If I'm gone, who carries on my gospel work? We have to be like Jesus. We can't relegate that to somebody else. There is no here am I, send him in the call. Here am I, send that one. It's here am I. Send me. Use me. We need to stop there. And God will we'll pick this back up. Where he's still moving. I hope you sense, just from the passages we've read, how he is intensifying the teaching. Content to let them come and look at him, see where he lives, see how he lived. Send them home. Coming by the seashore saying, follow me. Go by the tax collector's table, follow me. Send them home. And sitting, he calls to him. Come. And now it's for real and now it's permanent. And it's serious. No turning back. No turning back. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we look into the life of Jesus and we thank you for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And as best we know our hearts, we want to be more like Jesus. We know that you have said that your, your golden chain of grace set in motion that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Forgive us when the glorious truths of your sovereign decrees are more like a piece of jewelry than they are an agenda. Make us more like Jesus Help us to evaluate life, particularly as we come toward the end of life. Will we be able to say, I finished the work you gave me to do? Will we be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Oh, may it be so, Lord. May it be so. For Jesus' sake, amen.